Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby together with Guinness. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to a new edition of House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness. I don't know about you. I've had one of those days where, um, yeah, lockdown is, um, well, feeling very locked down, isn't it? So it's an absolute pleasure to have on the show this week, um, I think our most requested guest. We get a lot of requests from our audience, but this man has topped the, the bill by quite some distance. His Twitter profile says simply, born and raised on a council estate, in Manikerig, I don't know, I hope I've done that justice, and proud of it, do a bit of refin. He's also got the finest set of headphones we've had from any guest over the first two and a half years. Ground control to Major Nige. Come on in. How are you? Yeah, How's just, the flight path? I've just landed. Um, you have indeed. I see there's quite a lot hanging around on the flight path waiting to get behind you. I haven't quite a set of earphones. I've just had a borrow my, uh, my my partners and this is what it's given me. Unbelievable. What, what, what's, what's your partner do? It's like the most sort of, uh, I've never seen such a piece of equipment. Well, I think he uses this to play clicking PlayStation, I think that's what it is. <laughs> oh, right. You're not a gamer. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Um, uh, Atari. I had the, uh, do you remember the Atari? The Atari and Space Invaders and Pac-Man. I was pretty good at that. That, that was... Uh, I wish I'd have kept it was, that. Wasn't actually. there one called New Zealand Story as well? Was that an Amstrad? I can't remember. There was there was no, one I a long time ago with, with a fluffy Kiwi when I was about seven, eight, nine. No, I don't remember that. No, Atari, Atari <laughs> was the end thing when I was a, when I was a kid. <laughs> you've also got a hell of a glow on you at the moment. I mean, I, you, if, if I felt as well as you look, it, it looks like you've been on, on holiday for a month. How have you got the tan? Well, I have been on holiday, actually. No refereeing, no, no training, by the odd run now and again. Uh, but uh, no, I've just been, I just been out on, on the farm every day, pretty much, from 7 in the morning till about 8 or 9 in, in the night, just getting stuff done, which, you know, I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. A lot, a lot of, lot of work done, really. You know, fencing and getting the cows out and getting the silage ready to be it's been cut. Hopefully, baling tomorrow and cows calving. And it's been, it's been great, absolutely great. So that's where I got the colour from. Good. Welcome to my legs are white. Right? Oh well, yeah, you yeah, need to get yeah, those in the sun. Short, so my legs are white. Good on you, uh, cowheads. Back this week. How are you, Hoffleberries? Are we still recovering from Thursday's House of Rugby shorts? No, we're good. yeah, we're all right, we're all right. I mean, uh, that was interesting, Archie. I mean, he ruffled a few feathers in the old. Uh, I got a few people messaging me going, "This bloke's the biggest dick we've ever had." I was like, "Just relax, lads. It's a caricature of somebody." But otherwise, I'm good. I've been, um, I've been outside. I'm, I'm, I'm still editing my book, um, tidying up. My wife's given me short, sharp um, sort of thrift and said, "Right, you know, we need to start tidying. Too much rubbish. Too many piles of stuff around the house." She was very excited that Nigel was on today. She's a massive fan of Nigel, and she, I was sitting there and she went, "Who's the guest tonight?" I said, "Nigel." She went, oh, "Was that because I suggested him? I suggested him." So I told her that it was because she wanted you on. That we've got you on, Nigel. The fact that the whole rugby nation want you on, but we yeah, just going to tell her it was down to her. Bless her. Give her my regards. Last time I saw her, I was, in, was in Twickenham with you. Was it your last England game, I think, was it? Yeah, it might have been, yeah. yeah probably yeah. the only game. Yeah, you, you were the referee in that game, yeah, weren't you? Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you didn't yellow card me, no, which I didn't. is that's good. The that's the first time. It was unbelievable. Was that, was that was. the one house where you got kicked in the head by Owen? Yes. Was that, that, was, yeah. that was your farewell to international rugby. How funny is that, though? I, I, I honestly didn't occur to me. Nigel, you refereed my very last ever game. What a fitting, as you're my favourite referee, and I can say that now <laughs> without any bias. I can yeah. say without any bias, because you can't, you know, it doesn't matter if you yellow card me now, I just fucking tear it in half. Um, <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah, that is, I didn't know that. Good memory. I got a pretty good memory when it comes to games and who was playing, um, not so much sort of the in-depth, the score and stuff, but I um, mean, yeah, I got a pretty good memory for games and occasions, yeah. Not too bad. <laughs> no, it is, it is lovely, lo like genuinely lovely to have you on. Um, it's a pleasure to be on. I, I, wherever you go, the sort of positivity that follows you, and I, and I certainly need that um, today. How are you? How's life? I mean, there's so many things that we could talk to you about. Um, how is life right now? I mean, you've mentioned you're very busy with everything that's going on, but in a happy place, or are you kind of as bored of, of COVID as the rest of us? I'm not, to be honest. Um, you know, it's, it's strange. Out of what is, is a very sort of strange situation and um, a very difficult time for, for us all and, and for many, you know, much worse than than you and I probably. Um, but what it's done, I think, it's, it's done a lot of things. I think it's made you realise what's important in life. It's given people time to be at home doing things, spending time with family and that they wouldn't have been doing otherwise or would have taken for granted really, you know, and those just those little things, being, being at home, because refereeing just takes you away 
particularly in the Pro 14 and European matches and, and World Rugby matches, you know, you're, you're away all the time. And I always say that the English referees, you're, you're very lucky, you know, you jump in the car, drive an hour or two to a game on Saturday or Friday, then you're home. And in the Pro 14, you're, you're out to the country for two or three days on the weekend refereeing. So it, it has been good. And I haven't really sort of missed anything. I've just been just glad to do these things that I would have taken for granted and not been able to do. So yeah, in, in a very, very good place. But obviously, you know, you, you do think about the people who, you know, have had it much worse, than, as I said, than, than we have, you know, and the people who've very sadly passed away through this illness and stuff. And, um, and it is, you know, I, I, I think it has made us, a lot of people, go back to basics, I think, you know, realise how important community is, people pulling together and helping each other through difficult times, spending time with your loved ones, which things which you've taken for granted. So out of a bad situation, I think there's a lot of good things that have come out of it now and, and in the future, I think. You're a good man. You, you say some, some wise and profound words. You, you can often tell a lot about a man by his timeline. And I was sort of having uh, follow you on Twitter and, and on Instagram. And what's very noticeable recently is you've gone from well, there's a sort of lot of, you know, man about town and a lot going on in your life. And recently, a lot of posts just about cattle, which I've got to be honest with you, so I'm loving it. It makes me long for the green, green grass at home. But how, how long has have cows been such a big part of your life? <laughs> well, I started falling in love with, with, with farming when I was about seven or eight years of age, um, going up to a little farm behind where I was brought up. My... Me and my mum and dad uh, lived with our grandparents and they had about seven or eight acres. They kept horses at the time, but obviously when my dad was one of seven kids and when they were younger, my grandfather was a coal miner. He also kept two or three cows, chicken, pigs, just to keep the family going, you know. So I always sort of was born into the sort of um, countryside element of things and then worked on my uncle's farm during the holidays and then worked on a farm when I left school at 16 years of age and on a dairy farm here in, in West Wales. Down, um, so I've always wanted to be a farmer really and uh, you know it's pretty much impossible to, to buy a farm um, particularly when, when you're younger. So the only way I was going to get into farming if I was going to marry a, a farmer's daughter, and, and that wasn't going to happen. I, I, can't, <laughs> I couldn't have seen many farmers allow me to, be, to marry their son. So, <laughs> but obviously it's, um, it's come now to a time where, you know, after all the hard work of the years, I've, I've been able to afford to buy a bit of land, put a shed up. And then, um, funnily enough, to be honest with you boys, what, what, what happened was that the farming was hopefully going to be something that would naturally be a bit of transition for me finishing my refereeing career and going into to doing a bit of farming, something that I've always been passionate and loved, which would make the actual finishing the refereeing much easier than, than I was expecting it to be. Uh, so when I got back from the World Cup, uh, then when the first cows arrived, um, and I've got a herd of 27 Hereford pedigree cattle at, at the moment, um, but then obviously this has happened now. So the refereeing, I've just, the WIU have been great and hugely supportive over the years of me. I've just had a contract for another two years of, of refereeing. So uh, I'm not quite um, blowing the final whistle yet. So that's how it all came about really. And obviously I, I've got the cows and my partner and stuff. Uh, Barry, he's helping me and stuff now with, with everything around the farm as well. He's a teacher, so he's home, um, doing some work at home at the moment as well and helping me. So that, that's how it's all come about really, to, to be honest. A bit of a, a dream come true, but, but I tell you, to be honest, it's... Uh, it's a lot of hard work. It's great. I love every minute of it. But uh, I wish now I'd have stuck to refereeing for another 10 years, I think. <laughs> You're dealing with very similar creatures in many ways, I imagine. Hard to move and fairly stubborn. Are you, are you a disciplinarian on the farm or are you sort of... Um at one with the soil and the, uh, you know, the beasts you're looking after. No, I'm, 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 I'm at one with the soil and the beasts, really. I am, <laughs> um, I'm a big softy when it comes to, to animals and stuff like that. And um, no, well, they, they certainly don't listen. Um, I got a blue alkathene pipe, which you cut off as a bit of a stick, you know, and I never use it. Sometimes because Hereford cattle are so docile. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons I went for the Hereford breed. It's a very docile. They've got excellent meat in them. They're very good carvers, good mothers. So for somebody who's quite new to it all in one sense, they're pretty straightforward to keep, you know, unless you're unlucky, something goes wrong on, on, on the odd occasion. But I got this Alcathene 
sort of piece of, piece of pipe the farmers traditionally use. And I just gently now and again have to give one or two of them a poke when they when they won't move, you know. But uh, no, I'm I'm they 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 rule me rather than me rule them really at the moment. Please, will you take the pipe onto the field when you do your next game? I'd love to see you shepherding, scrummaging. When uh, perhaps pop a taser into the end of it as well. That would get scrums done in five seconds flat. Thank God, Nigel, you didn't have that when I was playing. My, I, my I, back I, would have been in pieces. Oh, you like you giving it for sure. <laughs> to be fair, though, to be fair, some of the players I played with, some of those cows are more intelligent than some of the front row I've, <laughs> I've, I've hung around with. To be honest with you, so and, and some of them are in better shape. I, I love your photos because I didn't. You know, like when you when you when you know someone. Um, you know your story. You know we've obviously you refereed me for most, well, all my career really. And uh, you know I picked up bits and stuff. We'll talk about other things in your, in your journey. But like I said the other day, I, was, I started following you on social media, and I was like for a while, and I see why is he always posting cows? Like I was like, what? What are the? I can't understand. I could, and then obviously I was like, ah, oh, right, he's got a farm and, and the picture. But because you always see life on social media in like snippets, you may yeah. not, I might not come across your feed for a couple of weeks. I was thinking he's really got a love for these big cows. <laughs> but now I've realised what. It, what it was all about. I thought you were eyeing up your lunch, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I've sent you some Welsh cakes, but I'll send you a yeah. few, few, few steaks will be will be next now. Oh, man, I'd love that because I'm, I'm a bit, I've become a big barbecue, uh, a big, big man on the barbecue, so I take the big, the big ribeyes and stuff. So the bigger the joint, the better. Yeah, uh, yeah I like that, yeah. Um, I want to ask you about you, and actually you, you mentioned sort of where you've grown up, etc. Have, have I got that right in that it's it's Manus Kelleg, is that right? Yeah, you, that pronounced, right? You, pronounced, you, pronounced, you pronounced that very well, actually. I'll actually you did. Oh, I got say. And all that. It was a long time since I've had a crack at that. Um, tell me about where the love of the game came from. Because am I right saying your old man was into football? Is that right? So why rugby for you? You know, my old man is a big foot, a big uh, rugby supporter. Loves his rugby. But, oh, his rugby fan. Yeah, but the village I was brought up in, in Money, Money the Kerry, which we should quite rightly say, that there's two... In the in the valley in the Gwendreth, I live in the Gwendreth Valley, uh, which is obviously famed for the Gwendreth Grammar School, uh, for the outside art factory, which Max Boyce wrote his song about, where you had Barry John, um, Carwin James, Jonathan Davis, and Gareth Davis all went to that school. All you know, four brilliant outside art of their of their generations, yeah. uh, and obviously Ray Gravel. The legendary uh, late Ray Gravel was from Manith Garreg, which is about four or five miles from Manith Kerrig. Um, but Manikerig is a small village. So when I was growing up there, we were only about 14 in the primary school. In the whole primary school, two teachers, 14 pupils. And there was about 120, 130 people in the whole village. Um, so when my dad was growing up there, there was a bit more people because f- families tend to have five, six, seven, eight children back then. But it wasn't a big village. So football team was quite easy to get by. You get 11 people and you could play a game of football. So they had a football team in this small village till about the mid-60s, late 60s, I, I think. Uh, so my dad used to play football for them. I mean, he's a pretty good footballer, I was I was told as well. And um, so the, the, the rugby started just... And I tell you, my first love and my first memory of rugby was I used to take around Saturday morning to guess the score. 10 pence a go. 12 houses on the council estate, a few more houses through the village and then a workingman's club. <clears throat> and I used to go around the houses, everybody paid 10 pence a go, some people would have five goals, 50 pence or, and they'd guess the score of an international match, the old Five Nations game. And then whoever was closest to the score then would would, would win win the money. Um, and I used to do that every Saturday when I was growing up as, as a kid when the Six Nations was on, Five Nations was on. And I remember in particular, so I would have been 1977, I would have been five, I would have been six years of age. I remember Phil Bennett scoring that try in Murrayfield when Gerald David danced out of his own 22, to me, which is one of the greatest tries ever. And I'll never forget, he scored that try. And as he put the ball down, he put it down underneath the post under his chin. And it was a yeah. brown leather ball. And I had a brown leather ball in, in the garden at home when I was a kid. And I went out on the field behind the house after that match as, as a six-year-old kid pretending to be Phil Bennett. And in the field behind my house on the council estate, there were two donkeys. They were called <laughs> Chocolate and Fudge. And I was there on the field pretending to be Phil Bennett, sidestepping the donkeys, Chucking, kicking the ball over the donkey, running round and catching it, pretending to score the try. And that was my first memory. And that's when I fell in the, in love with the game of rugby back in 1977. And then wow. refereeing just happened by chance many, many years later. So that's my first ever memory. And every time I, 
that try was actually on uh, social media on Twitter a couple and and to me Bill McLaren makes the game. He makes the tries. You know, his commentary just makes something special out of it. And uh, when I, every time I see that try, it just gives me goosebumps, really, you know. So that was my first love of rugby, and that's how I fell in, in, in love with rugby. Amazing. Did you play a bit as a youngster? And at what point did you say, quite fancy giving refing a going? Um, I played in the primary school. There were only two of us. Uh, my age boys so we had to join up with another primary school to play in their rugby team so I started playing rugby at about 10 11 years of age and then I played rugby in school uh, all the way through um what, what position were you well uh, there were three positions I started off as prop in a primary school <laughs> come on yeah honestly then I went I was quite sure my nickname in school was Pugsley because <laughs> they said I looked at Pugsley off the Adams family that was my nickname Pugsley yeah Right. And then I went to uh, play number eight for a, but when I was about 12, 13. And then I went to full back and I played full back until I was 16. And that's when the refereeing started because I, we hadn't won a game all year. We were a new school, a Welsh medium school just opened up in the Gwendoth Valley after the grammar schools were phased out in 1982, 83. Um, and we were at a bare 15. And that's the reason I was playing for the first 15, because we were a bare 15. We hadn't won a game all year. And we were playing a school Griffith Jones in St. Clair's in Kamar then, who was a very small school as well, who was closed a few years later. And my best mate, Wayne Thomas, was playing centre. He was a really good centre. Wayne went on to play for Ponaberen for years and Bonamine as well. So he's a really good centre, Wayne was. He scored a try right underneath the posts. And my other best mate, Craig Bunnell, was, was the captain. And I said, oh, I'll take this conversion. Score was 12 all. Last kick of the game. I'll kick this to win the game. Our last game of the season. First win as a school. And we were in year 11 then, the old form five. And the year eight and year nine, so form three, two and three, had been playing as well and they'd finished about five minutes earlier than us so they were all watching this game and I thought I'll take this conversion I'll just you know I'll be a legend a hero in school so right in front of the sticks up I go kick the ball and honest to god boys it went over towards the corner post it didn't go anywhere near <laughs> the place in front of me my mates didn't speak to me in a few days and John Biner the sports teacher, the late John Biden, unfortunately, he said to me, he said in Welsh, he said, Nigel, he said, Nigel, for God's sake, will you go and referee or something, will you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, right, okay then. And then the following week, I went to referee some kids' games in school, helping out, and I and I loved it. I just fell in love with the refereeing, and um, and the rest is history, as, as, as they say. That is amazing. The Don Fox of Merkerig, uh, <laughs> it turns you into, into one of the great icons of, of, of not just, you know, rugby, but, but sport as well. It's extraordinary how these things come about, isn't it? Tell me, tell me a bit more about sort of life at that stage, because I've read your book, etc. I know there's some very, very hard days. Are, are, you, are you comfortable sort of talking about that now? And, and how do you reflect, I suppose, on some of those challenges now when, you know, life, as you've mentioned already, is, is good and you're in a happy place? Yeah, it was a very, very difficult time. And um, it was quite strange, really, because being brought up in a small community where everybody knew everybody made life very, very difficult for me growing up as a teenager, about 19 years of age. And I started realizing that I was different to to what the norm was perceived to be, you know, I had a girlfriend at the time. And, you know, I'm a great believer that a lot of people will tell you that life is what you make it. But I believe before you get to that stage in your life, that, that life will make you or contribute hugely to the type of person you are and what your moral compass becomes when when you become older. Because the influence on your mum, your mum or dad, your parents, your guardian, your uncle, your auntie, you know, the, the sporting club you go to, the coaches, teachers in school, the community you're brought up within, all this will have a huge influence on you when you're when you're growing up and contribute hugely to, to the type of person that you will become for the rest of your life. Now, there's always exceptions to the norm, of course there is. And I was brought up in this very old-fashioned way in a small community, went to chapel, went to Sunday school, taught by my mum and dad that, you know, when you get older, you get a girlfriend, you get married, you become grandparents, you have kids, and that's the way the world keeps on going around. And here I was now at 19 years of age, 
I started to find myself on occasions, not always, just on occasions, attracted to men. And it was something totally alien. And because I was brought up in this small community, I didn't know anything about the big wide world. You know, at 19 years of age, I had never met or knew a gay person in, in person. So it made it really difficult for me during that time. But then on the flip side of it, when I came through that difficult time later on, the community rallied behind me and pulled together and got me me and my mum and dad and family through that difficult time. Um, and I'll never forget when I was about 14 years of age, and this will show you how old-fashioned the upbringing was. Uh, I was a bit, a bit younger than 14 years of age, actually, maybe about 12 or 13. Me and a couple of my cousins, I had four cousins, three <clears> of them were older than me and one was younger than me. And we were on a bike ride one Saturday afternoon back to my house and then my mum was making tea for us. I was sitting on the, and my cousin now, well, the one who was about 14, 15, he was a bit wiser and, and they're all they're living in the next village in Ponabiera where I live now, bigger village, knew a bit more about things. And they were sort of edging me on now to ask my dad what a homo was. And I didn't know, I didn't have a clue what a homo was at about, I was about 11 years of age I was. So go and ask your dad what a homo is. So I go to my dad now, in the, very innocently, uh, Daddy, what, what's a homo? And my dad goes, um, no, I don't know, he said. Ask your mother, I think it's something to do with some washing powder. <laughs> it was years before, apparently, there was a, there was a washing powder called home. There was an ad on the telly back. So that's, you know, my dad knew nothing about these things. So that contributed hugely to me finding things very difficult when I was a teenager then in the big wide world outside the small community. Um <laughs> But then the community then, you know, pulled together and got me through that difficult time, particularly, you know, when I attempted to take my own life and stuff and how difficult it was for my mum and dad at that time, you know, probably thinking, you know, is he going to try it again? And if he does, you know, will he get a second chance or, you know, or will he still be with us? And so very, very difficult time from that sort of late teens till I was about 25, 26 years of age until I finally accepted who who I was really. So, um, yeah, the upbringing, I wouldn't want my upbringing to be any, any different mind because as I said, I think it contributes hugely to, to who you are and society at the time. And that's what I fear now a bit, to be honest with you boys, is all those bad influences in social media today, which are so easy to influence young people you know, people hiding behind a fake profile or a fake name just think it's okay to abuse anybody, whatever creed or whatever their, you know, color of their skin, their their sexual orientation, their religious beliefs, the abuse that's on there today. And I'm just thinking that, you know, young kids growing up, are they thinking that, that, that it's okay to be like this? And that's what I really fear on social media. Of all the good things it has, like, you know, what we're doing here tonight, you know, social media has allowed this to happen, which is wonderful for people. Um, but I then the negative side of it, I really do fear, you know, the influences on young people today by that minority of really bad, horrible people who are out there. Um, Hask, I want to bring you in a moment, but Nigel, do you mind me just asking, you mentioned that, that night when, you know, you, you tried to take your own life. And am I right to say, you, there's quite a lot of whiskey and some paracetamol, and I th am I right to say, you found, took a gun as well. Do you look back on that now, and does it feel like a different person? Or is it something that is, has made you who you are? Are you totally disconnected from it, and, and it's gone? Or is it something that you, you live with, as it were? No, it's something that I, that I live with. You know, I'll, I'll never forgive myself for what I, what I put my mum and dad through when, when they got up that morning and, and read a note and thought that they were never going to see their, their only child ever again. And that's something that I have to live with. I'll never forgive for what I, you know, the hell I put them through then. And, and sometimes people, you know, when, when you hear so many people today, a lot of, so many people take their own lives today, particularly young people, and you hear people saying, oh, that's, that's a coward's way out, you know, that's very selfish, and you know, well, maybe it is, but when you're in that dark, dark place, you don't see it like that, you know, you, we're in that dark place, you actually believe that the people that matter to you most, or that you matter to them most, you actually think that they're going to be better off without you in their lives. And that's why a lot of people go to that dark, dark place and, and just lose that connection of what they're leaving behind. And when somebody does take their own lives like that, they don't see it like that at the time. And, you know, when, when parents lose their son or daughter through suicide, you know, they're, 
their lives will never ever be the same again. But when you are that person, you you don't see it like that. So I would never ever want to put my mum and dad through that again. I would never want anybody to put their mum and dad through that. I would never want to go through that time of my life again. But also as well, it has helped me to to be who I am today. It's helped me able to deal with things in my life today, which has made me stronger, I think, you know, and has made me realize how important life and family is and how important health is and prioritize things in in life really so although i wish it had never happened i think it has helped me a lot um and is enabling me now to help a lot of other people who are going through that that difficult time as as well so you know yeah i i course i do you know i i have it is my biggest regret is what i what i did at the time and, and put my mum and dad through but, but also as well i i used it now in you know becoming a, a better and and stronger stronger person and hopefully use it to, to the help to help others as well hopefully and that's exactly the point i was going to make i mean you know so many people will know you for, for what you do on the international stage in sport but hask it's it's stories like that and it's people like nigel who who tell it in the way that he does that actually will make such a difference for so many other people out there isn't it <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I agree with, with Nigel. I think, you know, um, we've, I've talked many times about the importance of social media, the, the real negative side. I think the the exposure of of things that just would people would were going on, but people wouldn't see it, you know, with the fact that camera phones and everyone's recording it and the things that people put in WhatsApps and the fact that we've become so desensitized to things we see and what we think is acceptable, what's not acceptable. I think Nigel's exactly right. You know, whereas, you know, he didn't have the exposure or people didn't know any different, you know, people are now being forced to see a, a, a worldview. The flip side to it is, you know, I know firsthand, you know, my, my brother for a long, long time struggled with his sexuality, went, you know, what found it very, very hard to, to come out. Obviously, you know, having a, a brother like me and and again you know my parents have always been amazing about it but i think sometimes the fear of not being able to you know the fear of what people will say and not and, and it's even when i was on on i'm a sled with caitlin jenna you know her, her so terrified and her wanting to take her life because she didn't think anyone would understand that she wanted to become a woman um but actually the reality of when she did it and when she came out everyone was so supported and rallied around but that fear and that disconnect the one important thing about social media is is that we can educate and inform so you know, uh, 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 you know a young nigel someone who might not be exposed to that or a family have brought up in a certain way will know that it's fine to be however you want to be and know that and i think that's the one benefit and however negative social media is that we can keep striving to put important messages and people can keep taking the reins and fighting against bigotry you know hypocrisy uh, it's so important and that's why i've always done so much because i saw it firsthand with my with my brother and i've always put it i've always put it like this you know I can never imagine having to turn up to work wanting to be something and I wasn't able to be like that. How hard it is. You know, it's hard enough to pretend to be, you know, uh, uh, something, let alone we want to be something else. And I think both with my Mm -hmm. brother, with Nigel stories, with Kate and all this kind of stuff, it's just reinforced to me the importance of it. And actually how hopefully Nigel's story, you know, different people's stories will, will, will make people think twice about doing something silly, going to a dark place and actually reaching out and realizing that, you know, you're not alone and there are so many people going through exactly what you're going through and, the, in, and, and being yourself is the priority over anything else. Well said. Um, would, was there a... Go on, Nigel. James was talking there. It's a wonderful story, which I don't think I've told James this before. I was out, um, I was out refing Stade Stad, Stad, Stad Francais out in Paris when, when James was playing over there. And after the game, he went across the road to have the, the function afterwards and, and the meal and stuff. And I'm pretty sure, it was, I think it was you, James, definitely. I think you got up and said a few words. And um, you presented me with the, you were on the front of the naked calendar of Stade Francais <laughs> that year. So he got up and he said, oh, we've got a gift for you. I think he gave Derek Bevan and Hugh Watkins and John Mason, I think was a TMO. They had ties, a Stade Francais tie, which is a lovely tie, you know, the pink and black one. And he gave me this bloody naked calendar. And uh, <laughs> so he gave me this calendar where he was on the front in all his glory. <laughs> and I sat back there with a Derek Bever goes to me, he goes, um, yeah, do you think do you think they know something? <laughs> and I I said to them, Well I tell you what they don't know, but then he got the calendar at home. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I don't want to ask you which was your favourite month, but uh, obviously the front cover. 
I forgot about that. I forgot about that. Fuck and there's, you a DVD I mean, yeah. there's a DVD in it as well, then, which showed how, how they how they made the uh, the calendar. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, you know what? When when they asked when Max asked me to do that, I, t- I told the story before. Is that they they Max called me up and he said before I ink could even dream dry. You know, I took all this criticism for leaving Wasp originally, going to play for the Playboys in Paris. You know, all the stories about Max, etc. And Max called me up and said, right, do you want to? You know, do you want to do the calendar? And I said, you know what? For once in my life, I'm going to shun the publicity. I'm not going to do it. So I said to Max, I I don't want to do this. (laughs) Ten minutes later, I got a call from my agent going, he's about to take your contract up. Uh, You need to go and do it. So two days later, I was on a Eurostar, whizzed over to to Paris. And I said to the agent, I said, listen, I'll do the calendar, right? But no full frontal. You know, Tom and Max Evans, you know, they're packing a bit more heat than I've got. They're very happy to be out there. I would say, listen, you know, we'll just keep something, you know, just a rugby ball or whatever. As soon as I stepped out in the roof on, in my pink dressing gown and fluffy slippers, there was just two cameras that, like, appeared at crotch height. And I've turned around, and obviously my French wasn't very good, and I was like, what's this? And the, the, the translation came back, it's for the behind-the-scenes DVD. And I was like, fucking behind-the-scenes DVD? Who's getting behind-the-scenes DVD? <laughs> and then sitting, at, sitting in a lawn chair with the director on the back of it was Max, with just a pair of sunglasses on, <laughs> and I just... That's who's getting the behind the scenes DVD. So, you know, yeah. But then they ended up selling it on the front cover. So yeah. I've not actually, yeah, I've not, I've not seen it, but I ended up being in that calendar four times. But obviously, my, I haven't aged well because they don't ask me anymore. <laughs> so, so, unlike you, has to be handing out free promotional copies of a, of a calendar with you on the front on and the DVD bonus just for those that want it. <laughs> Unbelievable scenes. Um, Nice. That is a brilliant story, and I'm, I'm yeah, I, I'm in San Francisco in, in the glamour years. It, it's it's an amazing thing, isn't it? Tell me a little bit more then about was there a moment you, you've mentioned about the struggling session? Was there a moment where the penny dropped? I mean, I'd, I'd love to know, you know, two, three, four months afterwards, where, whether your mum was still sort of full of tender support, or whether she said, "Don't be doing that again. We we move on from here," kind of thing. Was there a moment where suddenly it, it all began to work for you? Yeah, it was, um, and obviously, you know, I, 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 you know, try to take my own life, and I overdosed on 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 the paracetamols and stuff, and um, and drank a bottle of whiskey and stuff as well, and I had a, I had a loaded shotgun with me because I used to work on on the farm and stuff, and and I have no doubt that if I hadn't overdosed and, and slipped into a coma, I would have pulled the trigger of of the gun, and the, and there wouldn't have been a second chance, and. You know, my mum and dad, I don't know to this day which one of them, they rung the police and they were searching for me and they, they took me to hospital. I was a couple of days in intensive care. And then when I came out of intensive care, it was another four or five days in hospital before I was allowed home. And then people came to visit, everybody asking, you know, why do you want to talk about it? What is, and I didn't, still didn't tell anybody. And then after a couple of nights, people came to visit family and friends and everybody left. My mum and dad left at the same time as my uncle and auntie and a couple of my cousins. And then my mum came back on her own. And she came back and, and she said to me, she said, look, if you ever do anything like that again, then you may as well take me and your dad with you because we don't want to live our life w- without you in it. And that's all she said. She'd say anything else. And she just she just left the room. And I just sat there in silence for a couple of minutes and just realized what, I, what she had said, said and what I had done. And I just said, crying to myself. And, um, and that's when I said to myself, well, you know, this is who I am. I, I, and many things in life you can choose. You know, you can choose what type of person you are, what your moral compass is, what car you drive, what sport you play, what football team you support, what rugby team you support. Many, many things in life you choose, but your sexuality is is not one of them. And that's when I realized that this is who I am and I need to accept who I am. And, and that was that was the moment that my life was saved with those words from my mum, without a shadow of a doubt. And and that was the biggest challenge of my life, was accepting who who I was. You know, when I refereed that World Cup final in Twickenham, coming up to, to five years ago now, between Australia and New Zealand, in the biggest game in world rugby, which happens once every, you know, every, every four years, the pressure of refereeing that final, you know, in front of 85,000 in Twickenham, millions and millions of people watching at home, two of the biggest rivals in world rugby, Australia and, and New Zealand. The pressure on that game on that day was was absolutely unbelievable. But the challenge of ref in that final was nothing, nothing compared to the challenge of accepting who I was. And it was those words <clears throat> from my mum. And, and that's when I said to you earlier, that's when we realised that, you know, I've, I've been very, very lucky to get a second chance here. You know, a lot of people, you know, 
don't get a second chance. And um, that's what I try to tell people, you know, if, if you get a second chance, you, you'll never, ever do it again because you realize how lucky you are in, in life when you get that second chance. But you don't see it like that at the time. And, and, and it was those words from my mum that, that changed, changed my life forever for the better and, and, and no doubt at all, you know, saved my life as well. Thank God she did. Hey? Oh, I, I just wish she was. I wish she was here today to, so I could tell her that. Oh, nice. Um, I mean, it's an amazing story, and you tell it. I mean, I, we've done a lot of these. I'll be honest with you, and I haven't had, um, I haven't had sort of hairs on the neck standing up in any of the shows that we've done before. Certainly for for a long, long time. Um, tell me about Buenos Aires as well, and obviously it a break, sort of a big day in your refing career, but also for you personally as well tell me tell me a bit more about that 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 event yeah well i i did um <clears throat> even though when i accepted myself which was the biggest challenge that i still then lived for the next five or six years with that lie not telling anybody living that lie because i was i was fearful of if people find out in the macho world of rugby there was nobody out will i have to give up my refereeing which was my job and derek bevan told me years ago he said a happy referee is a good referee and he was so he was so right because I was living with that fear. It was affecting my my life personally and my performances. Because you know, as James will tell you, if you to be, you know, the best you can be, to be at your peak, to be the best in your position, like James has been for many seasons, it requires you to not only to enjoy it, but to be able to be yourself and happy within yourself. You go to training happy, you put that extra effort in because you're loving it and enjoying it. But when that's little something is eating, a fear, that worry is at the back of your mind, it takes away from from your focus, which takes away from your performance. And and it was affecting my refereeing because of this worry of living in this constant fear. And um, I refereed two test matches. I did um, Japan against Ireland, which is my first test match in 2005 out in Osaka. And I'd also done Scotland Barbarians up in Aberdeen. And I refereed the two games okay. I didn't referee them very well. And what happened, same now as back then, after each international window, They'll performance review your performances and if you're refereeing well, you'll get a better game or a bigger game next time to, to you know to challenge you. Um, or if you're still on the top of the game, you you know you get the big games. Um, and Paddy O'Brien was the referee's manager at the time and, and he rang me up and he said, Look, Nigel, um, I got 18 international matches to a point in this next window and I've got 19 international referees. So one referee is going to miss out and unfortunately that referee is going to be you because your performances in the last two games weren't, weren't good enough for, for test match level. And, and he was right and I knew myself it wasn't good enough because I was still worried and scared of being found out, living this lie. Um, and I thought I'd blown it. You know, after two test matches, I've, I've, I've blown it. It was my job, you know, what would happen when my contract's up next year and I'm not at international level, my job is gone. And uh, he rang back about 10 days later and he said, um, Argentina have uh, arranged to play Samoa in an extra game in Buenos Aires and we're going to point you to that game. And he said, you need to understand, Nigel, that if you don't perform in this game, you won't be considered to referee an international match again. And I thought, right, I've got the best part of four or five months here. Now, physically, I was fit. Mentally, I wasn't. And I thought, what, what I need to do, and, and then see what I did was be honest to myself and be honest to the people that mattered to the most. So I told people, I told Bobby Emin, the referee manager of the WIU, the WIU was so supportive of me, like they still are today, as was the world rugby world. You know, and I went to Argentina now, having accepted who I was with just the weight of the world just taken away from me. You know, I was loving life and loving refereeing, enjoying it for this final challenge. And I went out in that field and I did something that day that I did for the first time in Buenos Aires, but I've done it every single game I've refereed since, from refing a, a local under-14s game a few months ago here to refing the World Cup final when I refereed France against England in the Six Nations this year. Every single game since that day in Buenos Aires, including the World Cup final, I've done this. As I walked out onto the field, walked out behind the both teams, and as I walked onto that field in Buenos Aires, knowing this was my last chance saloon to prove myself, I walked across that touchline 
you know, I'm so happy and content in myself knowing, right, I, I, deep down, I'm, I'll show them, you know, that I can do this. And as I walked and crossed the white to the touchline, I said to myself, don't fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I didn't. The game went went well, you know. The performance review uh, was assessing me, said to me, Nigel, that was, an, that was an outstanding refereeing performance. Paddy O'Brien rang up and said, Nigel, that was an outstanding performance. That's what we want from you every game from now on. And, and since then, I've gone on to referee what at the moment is a record 98 test matches, a World Cup final, a record six European Cup finals, a record European matches, a record Pro 14 finals of six and a record amount of Pro 14 finals. And I'm not saying that because I'm not big headed in any shape or form, but I'm, I'm just saying that because if I hadn't accepted who I was, and more importantly, if I hadn't been allowed to be who I truly was, because of the wonderful world of rugby and the people in the sport, people like like yourselves, and I wouldn't have been able to be who I am, and I wouldn't have been able to achieve any of that um, since those two games. So, so that Buenos Aires game was was something something very 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 special, um, and that was the the kickstart to to the rest of my career. Which is a brilliant story. I want Don't Fuck It Up with your face as a t-shirt. We we produce merchandise on House of Rugby and that's one. And you're very famous for some very good sayings, but I've never heard Don't Fuck It Up before. So um, we'll, we'll get that training from now on. Um, Hask, ref, ref, being ref, why was Nige your favourite ref? What was it about him as a, as a man and a, a ref? Well, it was interesting cause, because I think... Um, you know, just as every player kind of changes and different, you know, whenever you knew you were getting refereed by Nigel, you knew you were getting refereed by Nigel because back in the day, in his earlier years, he had this unbelievable death stare. <laughs> like, honest to God, right? So there was two referees that are like, um, you know, were, were uh, you know, are kind of the, my generation kind of superstar referees. There was Nigel and there was kind of Alan Roland, originally, you know, was kind of the, the, the character kind of referee. You know, Alan, Alan Roland was like, you know, he used to walk in in a super tight top with his arms out like flex like this, and I, you know, and he'd always be, t- you know, he'd always be getting into me. So I watched Lawrence uh, say something to him. So I used to walk past him and I said to him, um, uh, "To be fair, um, you're uh, you're looking pretty good, mate. You've been working out." And I was like, "Actually, I have. Yeah, I've been I've been doing a bit. I've been doing a bit." And was very kind of excited by it. So I was like, kind of laughing. But then with Nige, when you get refereed with Nige, I would do so, and, he, and honestly, he'd blow the whistle and be like this. And I would be like that again. Oh, fucking hell, why is he looking at me like I've come down and burnt all his Christmas presents? So I was like really intimidated by Nigel. But as we got through, because he's always been like a clear communicator, always been like very good, um, you know, very good technically, always wanted to, to for the game to flow, had a personality. Because, you know, you want... You know, as a, as a rugby player, you want someone to facilitate the game. You don't want someone to dictate the game. But if you're going to have someone that's going to take charge, you want them to be assertive. You want them to have a personality, and you want to like be able to communicate with them. You want to be able to understand. Like you know, there's uh, there's referees that have come on the scene, and you know you just couldn't communicate with them. You just couldn't talk to them. There was like this shutter down. But with with Nigel, you could go and have a conversation at the right time, or you could you could do that. And it's just. It was just inspiring. As things have gone on, you know, his, his wits got sharper, or he's, or, the, or the death stare's gone up, and now he's just let his mouth say whatever he wants to say. And we've had some of the most, some of the most classic, classic rugby moments ever. Um, but it was definitely, yeah, it was definitely interesting because I think to start with, I was a young upstart, and I used to just get death stared off the off the field. But as we as we kind of bonded, and Nigel and I got on, I mean, he still yellow carded me as much as anyone's ever yellow carded me, <laughs> but, um, which was right with good reason. Uh, and we, yeah, when you said don't fuck it up, I was about to say, well, I can think of a few games, Nigel, if you want me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, want you know, but um, he, was, he was brilliant. And I, that's what we like as players. You know, that's what we like as players, is to be able to come into the match pre, how are you, how's it going, da, 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 because you don't want that them and us mentality, because I don't think it breeds a really conducive performance and, a, and, a, and a, like a friendly game. You want someone to be in charge, and Nigel was always in charge. And that's that's important. Just like a head coach is in charge, but you still want to be able to talk to the bloke. And and he always did that for me. And I just always always enjoyed it. I played some of my best rugby in front of him, and and you know played some of my worst. You know, 
The, the death stare, was that just like everyone else, you took an instant dislike to Hask, or was that just part of being a referee? Um, Alan Quinlan always used to say that. Quinny always used to say to me, every time you, Nigel, you scared me when you come in the changing room, you just look at me and say something, and I, I'd, be too, I'd be too scared then to do something on the field knowing that I'm going to have that, that stare. And, and Quinny's mum is a lovely card at Alan Quinlan's mum. Uh, always watching Munster, always have a chat with her, always after the game. And, uh, and Quinny said to me, I said, oh, there's only two people I'm scared of in my life, and it's my mum and you. Um, so I don't know where the stare, stare came from. It's just you know, just 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 that look, I guess you know, with um, without having to say or shout anything really. And that's what I you I will respect lot, my I, authority. I, I tell a lot of the young referees because I do some coaching with a couple of young referees like Craig Evans in in Wales. Who I'm going to be a lot of work with this year. Who'd really be one of the referees for the future? I, I have no <coughs> doubt. Um, great athlete and a huge promising referee as well. Um, and that's what I tell them. Like you know you. You have to be relaxed and, you know, be yourself. Don't don't try to be anybody else. Just just be yourself on on that field, you know. And and you know, have the conversation with the players. Be open to to, to speak with them. You know, know when you know they need to toe the line and not to cross that line with you. You know, don't let them walk all over you. But you know, never speak down to them. Speak you know, speak with them. Speak to, you know to them, not not down to them. And and I think. That does worry me a little bit about the future of refereeing is we, we do have a lot of young referees now who were really struggling to have that communication, that, that natural man management of the players, which is vital for, for a game. Because the easy part of refereeing is blowing the whistle. That's easy. Anybody can do that. It's, it's knowing when not to blow it is, is the secret. And I think that is, is, is what I, I, you know, I hope that the referees of the future will, will have that ability to communicate and enjoy the game, enjoy with the players, but also knowing where that line is as well. I think also, Alex. Sorry to touch it. I think you know one of the one of the big things we, we've talked about, and I know in my last two three years of playing, and subsequently, you know, this season, there's a lot of talk about kind of um, the, the exact terminology. Nigel will be able to help me, but about just the ethics of the game in terms of this over appealing, this diving, this trying to play up, this kind of almost football mentality. I think it's it's strong referees like Nigel which have kept that discipline and differentiated us from other sports. Because, you know, I think, firstly, you know, when players appeal, I've never, ever seen a referee change their mind by whatever you said to them, ever. So it doesn't really matter. I think getting some clarity over stuff is important. But I think the one thing that separates rugby from any other sport, and when, when we always talk about it, even though they're incomparable, is the football and, uh, uh, and rugby kind of analogy, is that I love the fact that a referee is, while he facilitates the game, when needed, he is the centre of attention and the disciplinarian, and his... He, his authority is respected because without that you have chaos and where some people say authority is an illusion on a rugby field it's not you know he, he, his decision decides uh, you know whether you stay on whether you go off and, and the formation of the play and I, and I do echo Nigel's points I think some of the younger referees these guys are great they have personalities they've, they've come up watching stuff they have more access to, to to rugby on TV they see they see these big moments but they need to have those personalities as well they need to have the confidence to be able to talk because if you sense weakness it's a nat- player's sportsmanship the natural thing is to try to bend every rule mm. bend around everything. And, if, and if they feel like anyone's malleable they're going to manipulate them and then we get this over appealing and, and, you know, and you see at night, you know, some of the clips, you know, the, the, if you look at Nigel's highlight reel on YouTube, some of the clips, you know, he said to people, we're not, you're not, we're not football, we're not this, don't do that, do that again. And you have to be like that sometimes. And, and, and people get funny about it, but that's the way to do it, to stop manipulation. Because if you give an inch, the lab will take a mile. Mm. Can, can I just very quickly say, I, the two things. One, did you see that clip on social media the other day? Of, um, and I love the fact you keep referencing Derek Bevan because... I was saying the other day, whenever I hear Matt Gitto's name, it's always Mick Gitto, because that's what you hear from the Australian commentators. You will forever be, Nigel, because that's Derek Bevan in the in the TMO truck. Nigel, you may a water tray. It's, it's kind of just, you're synonymous with Derek calling out very loudly from the back of the truck. But the second thing is, did you see that clip going around the other day on social media of Derek Bevan refereeing New Zealand against South Africa with, yeah. a, with a mic on? And he called Fitzy, and it must have been James Dalton again. He said, right, boys. I don't want any fucking about. And that was his sort of, his call to arms. Crouch, touch, pause, engage. And I was just, how often are you tempted just to actually get into people rather than bite your tongue? Derek, Derek Bevan was was well, was a great, great, well, one of the greatest referees and, and a great character. He was my, he was my, when he finished at the top level of the game, 
and retired in 2000. I actually took his place on the uh, sort of panel in, in Wales. And he was my coach then for about, until the World Cup in 2015, he was my coach. Um, and also he was my TMO for, of all the 120 European Heineken Cup matches I've, I've done, he was my TMO for over 100 of them. And we had this, um, let me a bit of a secret here. We had this little code word, because when he was my coach and my TMO, and the code word was trigger. If we miss something in the match, let's say there was a, a blatant knock on in the game, it's totally blatant, and us as officials on the field had totally missed it. And Derek saw it in the truck. Now, this was only now when it was absolutely clear for everybody except for us. He'd go, and he, he did it twice in, in the whole time trigger, trigger. That's all he would say, because you're not supposed to say anything like that. So the protocol, and you go, trigger. And I knew that, because 99% of the time, you'd have a just that something did happen there. I thought it had, bang. So he did it twice. So that was the code word. And uh, it was only used twice in, in all the sort of 12 years together. And I was over-refereeing. Uh, it was a pool match. It was the final round of the qualifiers. Tremont against Leinster. Leinster needed to win to qualify and yeah. Tremont needed to win to finish top of the group. And we were about 20 minutes into the game and all I heard was um, Del Boy, Del Boy. <laughs> Del Boy? <laughs> <laughs> So I couldn't do nothing. I don't know what hell he's on about. So half time, down he comes from the TMO truck. I said, what the fuck does Del Boy mean? He said, well, haven't you heard the news this morning? Trigger's died. The actual character Trigger had died. That <gasps> oh, no. He died when Derek Bevan was on air. He, the news came out, you know, Trigger from Only Fools and Horses has passed away. So Derek was in the TMO truck. So Derek thought, well, I can't say Trigger now. He's just died. So he goes, Del Boy, Del Boy. I think what the hell did he tell me? But he was uh, making you know, up as he go along. He was a great, great character, Derek. Derek was wonderful. Do you remember the try that France scored against New Zealand to win the second test in 95 out in Eden Park? Yeah, a try from the end of the world. Try from the end of the world. Well, Derek Bevan was refereeing those two test matches. He refereed the first one in Christchurch when France beat them and then he was refereeing the second one in Eden Park. And... Um, I think it was Grant Fox had just kicked to the corner. New Zealand had been in control all game. They were now going to win this game, so the series would be drawn, and France were never going to get the first win on Test Series on New Zealand soil. There's a line out then, as you saw, right at the end of the game, pretty much. They win the ball in the line out. They run it from behind their own line. Philip Saint Andre. They score this brilliant, brilliant try from the end of the world. And of course, New Zealand have lost now the test first series. Fitzpatrick is captain. He's trudging back now, deflated totally after being in control all game and they've lost it. So Derek Bevan has given the try underneath the sticks. And as he's walking back now after giving the try, Fitzpatrick and a few of the New Zealand forwards are trudging back now to get behind the posts. And as Derek Bevan passes Fitzpatrick, he goes to him... Uh, what a wonderful try that was. A bit magic to Derek Bevan who goes, why don't you just fuck off, Bevan? <laughs> I hope that'll be a red card from your wallet these days. That is true. Ask, ask, ask for see that or ask Derek. Derek always says that story. You, you know, you, uh, you couldn't say that. You couldn't do that now. Like, you know, you couldn't. No. Back then, you, you, you could, you know, and it's a, you're a wonderful character, Derek Bevan. Well, you say that, Nigel. Actually, you say that. But, but uh, you know, what was it when... Um, South Africa were playing England at Twickenham and old Steve Walsh, uh, when when um, someone cut a try, he's running along going, wow, what a try, that's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's like, when we watch it back afterwards, we're like, you, you, what's the referee doing cheering South Africa? I think it was, um, I can't remember who scored, but he was whooping and hollering. I couldn't believe it. You're right, you can't do that anymore. But he did. He, he, he who controls himself controls the game. Wasn't that the old, um, on, the, on the forearm, Steve? Yeah, yeah. The tattoo. Um, Nigel, I'm conscious of your time. I, and I, what I really don't want to do is, is rush through this because there's so many other things that, that we'd love to talk to you about. Could, could we do a part two at some point or can we borrow five minutes? We've got so many readers' questions 
Um, what, how how you fixed the time? Yeah, you got the time. Yeah, no problem. You're right. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Right, we're going to keep going with Nigel in just a moment or two. But first of all, um, thank you to everyone who's sent in questions. We've got a few of those to come as well via the Facebook group. Um, but you are listening to and watching House of Rugby brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness, with me, Alex Payne, alongside the Hask and the legend that is Mr. Nigel Owens. Don't forget to check out our House of Rugby short series. That's out every Friday during the lockdown. Twenty minutes of no frills rugby conversation with a different guest each week. We went. Went deep into the heart of club rugby at the Clapham Falcons last week with its legendary star man Archie Curzon playing at level five but always ready to step up to the premiership if called upon. Stand by your beds and have a listen to this. I feel great. I feel honestly I could go out there and I you know if there are any pro clubs listening I can come and do a job for you. you know, I look at I look at Harlequins. Marcus Smith he's too young he hasn't got the experience. Put me in there. Me cares he to me. Who's inside centre for Quinns? Uh, Francis Saeli. <laughs> okay, he sounds decent. Never, I don't know. Don't know. <laughs> he sounds good. He sounds like he. He sounds like he could be decent with ball in hand. So that was the legendary Archie Curzon therapy. Just about getting us through that session. Make sure in the meantime you download a new podcast from Joe, which is called Sports Pages, and that digs into the stories behind some of the greatest sports books ever written. This week on Don McRae's journey to the heart of the fight game, Dark Trade Lost in Boxing, and here he is talking about what it's like to be in Carl Frampton's dressing room just before the ring walk. Carl was kind enough when he fought Leo Santa Cruz in 2016 to allow me to do the same thing. You know, I was with Carl in the last few hours before the biggest fight of, of his life. And it's such a privilege. And again, I, I didn't want to be close. I just wanted to stand and, and, and just observe and watch. And, the, and Carl understood that. And Tony, I think, also intuitively understood that I wasn't going to get in his way. But it's such an amazing thing to to witness. And although I, I love going to boxing and I love fights, those moments for me are the most powerful of all, is those quiet moments. A lot of fighters have said to me, you feel like you're going out to face the hangman mm. and that you're executioner. And these are even the top, you know, Carl never lost a fight. James Tony, pound for pound, number one in the world at that stage. And yet they feel such fear because of the, the jeopardy of boxing. And he, he turned to me at one point where he'd been so somber and kind of afflicted with nerves, which is hard to believe that people like Tyson and Tony are nervous, but he was nervous. And he kind of looked at me and he said, this is boxing, baby. Quick reminder as well, you can join in our House of Rugby Facebook group. More than 40,000 of you playing in there at the moment. And if that wasn't enough, you can also check out our Instagram, at Rugby Joe, for photos, news, and behind-the-scenes bits and pieces. You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Um, when did you get to the point in your refing career where you felt you could impose yourself on the game. I mean, some of your witticisms make the game and, and you, you've got a cult following. And, and at what point did you feel comfortable enough on the pitch to to give more than perhaps we see from others? Um, I think it, it came naturally, I, I think, because, you know, I was brought up in a very humorous family uh, in, in rural West Wales where humour is every part of everyday life. My father's a, a great character. My uncle, my grandfather was, and a lot of people around me then. So wonderful characters in, in, in West Wales back then. Um, so it sort of was naturally, you know, I, I was on stage doing stand-up in Manikarig Workingman's Club at 14 years of age. The entertainment hadn't turned up that night. And uh, I just got home, put some clothes up, dressed up as a, a Welsh comic and and did some, some jokes on stage for 30 minutes. So I was actually on stage doing jokes a long time before I started refereeing. And uh, so it sort of naturally came being able to communicate. And, you know, I went to and when I, I was in chapel, you know, reading a hymn and stuff at five years of age, you know, through Sunday school and stuff like that. And then I joined a young farmers club where, you know, opportunity to do public speaking. So the communication side of things became something natural in one sense. And on that field, and people have asked me this, they say, well, do you, do you prepare these lines? And I said, you know, I honestly don't. I just go out in the field and I just say it as, as it is and, and, and as, it, as it happens. And I actually sometimes, I get home. Or somebody will send you a text or message and say, um, oh, that was hilarious today. You've you've just gone viral now with what you said. And I go to myself, well, what the hell did I say then? 
oh, you said this. And I said, I said, do people really think that's so funny? It's just, it's just me being, being me, really. And, and I suppose... Have you fro- I think you've frozen on our end, Nigel. Oh, it looks like we've lost Nigel. The, um, the Wi-Fi on the farm has dropped out. So bear with us while we try and get him back. There is the great man once again. The lights have dimmed a little bit. Um, well done to the technical support staff backstage. Um, Hask, kick us off again. Sorry, Nigel. Unfortunately, that's the technical beauties we have of doing things remotely. Um, so we won't keep you much longer because I know you're a busy man. And those cows are not going to feed themselves. One question I've got to ask you is that something I, I, I get asked a lot by my rugby Norse friends who, even like Paino, I pretend I don't really know outside of House of Rugby, is... Since you know New Zealand won the World Cup and Australia won the World Cup in 91, they're the only two sides to be led by backs as captains. Everyone else always had a forward. Do you think it makes a difference having uh, a forward as captain or a back as captain? Yeah, so it, it, it has its advantages when you have a forward as, as, as a captain. Um, Ireland, for example, when you know, in the heyday you had... Peter Driscoll was captain, but Paul O'Connell was the pack leader. So pretty much most of the conversations would be with Paul O'Connell. And then if, you know, you wanted to speak to the captain or there's something a bit more serious, you need a Drickle to speak to you, then then you'd give him a shout. Because he always used to say, Nigel, look, I, I'm captain, give me a shout if you need me. Otherwise, Paul will deal with it. So, yeah, I, I can see the advantages of having a, a captain close into the action where the referee is. But if you've got a good captain, I'm, I'm not sure really it matters where, where he is really, to be honest. But I suppose if you are out on the wing, out of the way, then you could be away with the action where you're close in. You can, you know, have that little conversation or say those little things really maybe that, you know, far out you can't. So it all depends on your captain. You've got a good captain, I think it matters where he is. But um, yeah, I can see the advantages of having a forward as, as, as a captain, as long as that forward wasn't you, of course. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> little, little nip at the kidneys. Has do you want to ask Chloe if she if she could possibly pause on the eating just until we finish? It's not me. It, it, it's Xander oh, no. eating away. Oh, it's, it's not a nice stuff. If you could, that's the one. Um, right, now I'm conscious we've gone way over time, and it's partly your fault because we could sit and listen to you all day. So what I'd love to do is, if you'd have, if, if you'd be happy, is, is say come back another time. Let's talk properly about the career. But we have had so many. We've never had readers' questions before, but this is part of our. It is perfect, Paul, um, because you're our most requested guest. Um, it's a weekly test in 119 and a half seconds, because that's how long it takes to pull the perfect point. Nigel, you'll know that better than I most. Let's try and rattle through them quick fire. Um, and thank you to the Facebook group um, for providing hundreds. We've picked out the best dozen so. So the quick fire game, um, nice gentle loosener from Kieran, who says the b- biggest error you've ever made as a ref. There you go. Error? I haven't made any. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Campbell says, considering you say this isn't football a lot, are you actually a football fan? Yes, this isn't soccer is the correct one, tell him. Not this You're isn't correct. football. And yeah, no, I do enjoy my football. As a kid growing up, I was a Wrexham supporter and still am really. But I know I enjoy my football. Yeah. How are Wrexham faring? Yeah, not too good at the moment. They went out to the, the sort of top flight a few years ago. But I always hop back to the day they beat Arsenal in the FA Cup when Mickey Thomas scored that uh, scorcher of a goal. You, do, you are a Wrexham fan. Um, if you knew all the rules, do you think you could referee a Premier League football match? Yeah, I, I think I could. They'd probably be down to five a side by half time, but uh, I think you could make the transition. I think it'd be a bit more difficult to go from football to rugby because the laws are a bit more complex, where the laws in football are a bit more straightforward. So yeah, I, I think I could. I'd like to give it a go anyway. Have you ever? Have, has that ever been a conversation? I would love to see you do it. Yeah, a few people have asked. Uh, there's been a few conversations about about doing it. So, um, you know, maybe it'll be in the pipeline now when I actually hang up the, the whistle of actually refereeing, maybe we'll see. But no, I'd love to give it a go. Right, let's make it happen. Um, who is the one player during your career that you've maintained a great relationship with when you've been refereeing? Asks Jim. Oh, James Haskell, of course. He's the only Rubbish. one I've sent Welsh kicks to. With, is that, is that right? You've never sent Welsh kicks to any other player? No, he's a, no, he's a Welsh kicks. Well, he requested them. Well, he was looking for a Welsh kick in Swansea, actually. Do you, know do you know what Chloe said? Do you know what she said to me today on the sofa before you came on? A- a- apart from wanting to have you on and her idea, she went, you know, have you got the Welsh cakes? And I said, actually, I bought some from the supermarket. I get them every day from the, the supermarket because I have them at breakfast. And she went, but they're not as good as Nigel's. They were <laughs> incredible. Do you know what she said? She went, they were incredibly good Welsh cakes. I said, yeah, but we can't make them now, Chloe, between now and then. She was like... Yeah, I suppose. But they were lovely. So she, even she likes them and she's scared of carbs. So, it's, well, not scared of carbs, but when she's counting Double calories. thumbs up. Is there a little, is there a little salt bay? What's, what's the secret to a Nigel Welsh cake? 
Yeah, no secret really. Just get the ingredients right. A little bit of sugar on top. A bit of sultanas Delicious. in them. That'd be nice. But a current. Mm. We'll put the recipe on the Facebook group. <laughs> Have you ever been scared about making a major decision at a critical moment of a big game? Asked Toby. No, I haven't. I've been pretty nervous sometimes you made a big call if you've got it right or not. Uh, and that's the pressure that the screens in the stadium because if you make a mistake on the field now, you can see that you've got it wrong. And then you have to referee the rest of the game and forget that you've made that mistake because if you don't, it'll affect your, your performance. So I learned pretty early on from the advice of Derek Bevan if you're going to go out in the field and be afraid of making a mistake, then you're never going to be make a referee because it's impossible to referee a game without making a mistake. But the better you are, the less mistakes you do and the mistakes you do make, they don't really matter in the context of the game. Good answer. Which current international player do you think would make a top referee? Asks Rob Kennedy. Pretty much nearly every scrum half. Or whatever. I, don't right. know what, I don't know what it is. Every scrum half would make a perfect referee, I think. Well, Carl Dixon, you, the eloquence is, is a, making a, he's a very good referee, scrum half. He Nick, is. I was, Nick, Nick Berry from Play for Wasps, Australian. Yeah. I, very good scrum I half. was going to say, do you are you a fan of players becoming referees? And you mentioned Nick Berry, um, Lee Dixon, obviously, and Glenn Jackson, one of the earlier yeah. ones. And Paul Williams from New Zealand, scrum half. Uh, Alan Roland, ex international yeah. scrum half as well. Um, yeah, I am. You know, it's the same as everything, really. I think if you're good enough to do something then you should be doing it. You know, you shouldn't be treated differently or, you know, pushed up the ladder because you're an ex-international referee. You should be pushed up the ladder because your ability to, to, to referee. So I am a big fan of ex-players becoming referees. Yeah, as long as they are good referees. Good, okay. Question from James Haskell. What would you do to change scrums as the biggest waste of time in the sport? <laughs> um... I don't think they're as much of an issue as, as we think they are. If you really sit down and look at some games, the scrums are not an issue. In some games, they are. So I wouldn't change much in the scrum, but I would like to quicken them up a bit, you know, and maybe we as referees need to be stricter with teams that are delaying the setup of the scrums that we deal with them and penalise them. Okay. I've no idea what Nick Dowling's been smoking. Given a choice between Hask, Tins and myself, who would do the best job on the farm? Oh, Tins, I think. He's got a farmer's nose, isn't he? He looks like a farmer, I think, isn't he? <laughs> Good, Definitely. because we'll give you that because he's not here as well. Uh, he probably owns a few farms. He probably owns half of Wales, actually, from the sort of <laughs> farm of Christmas, a tree under the tree, I would have thought. Um, Eminda says, does any referee truly understand the dark arts of the scrum and which player was the best at getting away with it? That's a good question. Yeah, re referee, we do understand the scrums. There were the better referees understand the scrums, de definitely. Look, some, sometimes a scrum collapses and, and you don't know. what. I honestly don't know who took that down, and that's when you reset the scrum. But most of the times, the better referees, they will know what's going on. The best one was um, I refereed one of my first Irish derbies to referee years ago, and uh, every single scrum went down. The first 10 scrums of the game, I think it was Munster against Connaught, every single scrum went down. It was my first game in Ireland, pretty much. You had Alan Quinlan shouting from the back row, blaming the Connaught front row. You had Ronan Agara running in and pointing out who it was. You had the Connaught scrum half telling me it was the Munster front row. Everybody's having their say. And I just blew the whistle and I said, right, boys, that's enough. That's enough now. At the moment, there are about 20 referees on this field. And Peter Clossey was the one who was taking the scrums down. He turned to me and he said, yes, he said. And you're not one of them. <laughs> 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 the claw has spoken. I wasn't one of them. So then for the next four scrums, I penalised him. He got the message. Quite right too. The, the man with the whistle has the last laugh. couple more just before we go. Uh, which law would you change and why? Anything you don't like about the game right now? Yeah, substitution laws. I think there's, there's far too many substitutions in the game. When Imagine you've got, you've got eight substitutions on the bench. That's more than half a team. You bring 16 substitutions on in the second half and the game just becomes stop, start, stop, start. And also as well, I, I ask me not like this, but I think if you reduce the amount of substitution and players have to play the 80 minutes, then it would mean players would lose a couple of kgs because they need to last longer. I think it would then have bit less big collisions in the game where you actually have players would try and, you know, when we started playing in school, you were taught, you run at a guy with a ball, you try to beat him, you try to run around him, size at him, dummy his scissors, uh, pass the ball, chip over his head. 
now, too many players now are just running straight into the opposition guy because of their bulk. I think reduce the substitutions, it'll reduce the bulk of the players, and you'll actually see then a bit more rugby of people trying to actually beat people rather than try to run over people. So I think that would be good for the game. Very wise. Last but not least, have you ever seen a passage of play, a movement or a try that was so good you forgot you were refereeing? <laughs> yeah, I think it was in... Um, it was in 2013 when I refereed that epic game out in Ellis Park between um, oh. South Africa and New Zealand, where um, the try that Habana scored, I think it was his first or second try in that game. New Zealand had scored a couple of tries and South Africa just came back. And the way that Habana just, just left players in dust, basically, I just thought to myself, oh my God. You know, and I, I just I just forgot I was a referee for the moment, you know. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure subconsciously it was a bit of me going, Go on, go on, go on, you know, but <laughs> it, was, it was, it was, it was absolutely a brilliant, brilliant try, you know. Does, does what one final question. Does the hundred would, would does a hundred tests mean anything to you? Are you a man for numbers and stats? Would you like to do a couple more? Where are you on the international decision at the moment? Yeah, well I'm still refereeing if I'm if I'm appointed, hopefully. Um yeah, you know, it, I think if, if if any referee said to you, I oh, know numbers don't matter to me if I get to 100 or not, then I don't think they're being honest with you because I think anybody as a player, as a referee, you know, if you're that close to the 100 mark and, and you're still good enough to be picked or to be appointed as a referee, then it is something special. Pardon me, it is something to save, but of course it is for you and the whole family, you know, it, it's, it really is. Um, now, if I wasn't refing good enough, then nobody would have to tell me, I don't think you're going to get to the 100 because you're not refing good enough. I, I'd be making that decision myself. Look, I'm not good enough to referee at this level anymore. And whether the 100 was one or two away, I wouldn't want to get it just to tick the box. But as long as I'm still good enough and enjoying it and doing my job for the most, in people, most important people on the field, which are the players, then I would like to get to 100. And, and yes, it would be something... Very, very special and something to be to be proud of. But I want to get to it because I'm good enough to get it, not because people think, oh, let's take a box and let's get to 100. That would be the wrong reason and I wouldn't want that. We all hope you get there. Absolutely no doubt about that at all. Has going to leave the final word to you. Just, I mean, we don't often pour a lot of love on referees, but, but the man we've had on tonight, and hopefully we'll have part two before too long, deserves every bit, doesn't he? What a story, what a man, what a character. Yeah, look, I, I think um, you know we're very privileged on on the house rugby. You know, when we when we started, you know, Tins and and Alex and myself, we didn't know where this was going to go. And I think every time we have someone on, it's an adventure. I think today was was everything that I could ever want to to, to have as a podcast. You know, moving stories, humour, to hear your your journey, Nige, to, to, to you know to get a chance to show your personality. Um, you know, I love working with you on, on the field. I think what you do uh, on the field is incredible. I think what you do off Field is so important. I think the message is important. We need to have you back. I know you're a hard man to press down and very costly these days because them, them, <laughs> them, 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 them Look at, them look at him, yeah. Look at him, yeah. Listen to him. Costly. Okay. <laughs> we need to pay him so he can keep his broadband connected. That would be a lovely start for recording this thing. <laughs> but but I think I think hopefully everyone will will, will appreciate that and, and you know hopefully people who are listening will, will appreciate the story and maybe we'll help people. And um I hope you get to hundred, you keep being the incredible character you are, and I'm so glad I don't play anymore so I can't get yellow carded. I tell you what, Nigel, if you try yellow card me, red card me in the street, man, I'm gonna fill you in. And that's it. <laughs> and I won't get excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, and what people won't know on this pod is that you, you've got so much to do on the farm. You ca you've got to go get the calves done. Is that right? Yeah, I got to go and check the cows. I got to cow do the calf and stuff. So and you will check uh, check the other cows out in the field and make sure they they're, they're right and uh, get stuff ready for for tomorrow as well. Then I've got two cows in a harness actually going around the house on the belt, which is keeping my Wi-Fi and my electricity going. So <laughs> I've got to go and let them know. <laughs> Um, you've been an absolute superstar. What people won't know is you've given us an extra, basically, two hours of your time in order to get this done. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for being an absolute superstar. I know you mentioned earlier your mum would be very, very proud. You are um, you're an absolute ledge of our game, and um, there are so many people so very fond of you. So thank you very much for your time. Um, just before we go, we'd love to have you back another time soon. Look after yourself, look after your partner, look after the cattle, um, and see you blowing your whistle before too long. Yeah. 
It'd be my pleasure, boys. And thanks for having me on. Keep up. You're, you're a superstar. That's it for this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to House of Rugby. Don't forget, you can dig into our entire back catalogue on podcasts, on YouTube, uh, and you can talk about your favourite shows in the Facebook group. Don't forget as well, you can download Sports Pages, the new interview podcast from iTunes. That's on your podcast app. Um, thank you once again to James. Well done. You played the part perfectly on this one. Looking good. Thank you to Nigel, the great Nigel Owens. We'll see you on Friday for another House of Rugby Shorts. Um, we're back next Wednesday with the usual show where we are joined by the Saracens and England hooker, Jamie George. Until then, love and hugs, stay safe, and we'll speak to you soon. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.